hopefully you had a wonderful weekend. Happy Halloween. Get, I'm sure you're all dressed in your costume. So that, that, uh, send me some snapshots uh, of that. So we'll go ahead and get started here. We've got uh, a lot to cover. So first thing is I ran across this slide and I thought it was a great slide just to remind us of what we're doing with motivational interviewing and with our scripts. The, uh, the first thing we want to do is resist, and that is resist telling them what to do. Avoid telling, directing, or convincing your friend, and we call that what? Avoid what? We have a little uh, rhyme that I put together that kind of talks about uh, what we should not do or resist doing. Tell, sell, preach, teach, right? Tell, sell, preach, teach. So resist telling, selling, preaching, teaching. The second thing is understand their motivations. Seek to understand their values, their needs, abilities, motivations, potential barriers to avoiding, to ch changing behaviors. How do we do that, guys? How do we understand them? How do we make sure we understand them? How do we make sure we, make sure we read their minds? Yes, we ask questions, Jonathan. We ask questions, Cheryl, right? So that's how we make sure we can understand their motivation. Because will they say things they don't believe? They'll say yes to things they don't believe. They'll say no to things they don't believe. But will they actually uh, verbalize in complete thoughts things that they don't believe? That's right, Jerry, no. That's right, Perry, no. Next thing is listen, which uh, basically you, uh, you and L here, understand and listen, come together. You ask questions, and then you listen with empathy. And here's the one thing I do here uh, when, people, when, our, when our advisors listen. And I do this too. We all do this. When we listen, guess what we hear? What do we hear? When we listen, tell me what we want to hear, Jonathan. Yes, Jay, Jerry, what we want to hear. So you have to, be, you have to listen with the mentality that I want to know what's going on with them. I don't want what they're saying to match what I want. Make sense? And the last thing is empower. Work with, uh, this is uh, for friends to get them to change from uh, uh, um, destructive behaviors. But um, work with your friends to achieve, a, uh, to set achievable goals and identify techniques to overcome barriers. So I actually, instead of their empower, I'd rather use the empower we use. And what's the empower, where do we use empower? Gots, yep. It's the most powerful gots there is. So I like our empower better than this, this slide's. Empower. So the next thing I want to do is uh, we haven't had a lot of advisors talking about their success because we've had so many advisors having success. Again, we are a tickled pink here. We have not had this kind of success with marketing since the since the I mean really in the last 16 years. Even when we were filling up seminars with with tons of people, it was rare to get four or five people with with great assets in front of people for any particular seminar. And we're doing that without all the hassles, without all the risks and getting our, our guys in front of them. And, and the guys that spent the summer, and, and kudos to you guys, man. So thanks, thanks a lot. The majority of guys, 67% of the guys spent the summer really locking down the 21. And they're, they're, they're close, man. Needless to say, I'm a happy camper, and 67% of the guys are happy campers. But because of that, I haven't had a lot of people talking about the success just because we've had so many people having success. But Jerry came to me with a case uh, last week and was telling me about a success that one of our advisors had. And I think it's a special instance that I thought it was worth everybody hearing. So uh, Jerry and Chad, can you tell us about that? Hey, thanks a lot, Mike. Good morning, guys. Yeah, um, one, of the, one of the things, Chad's a, a guy that's been working with us for a little while here. And he had, a, like Mike said, he's got a, a unique case. And I think what, what makes it unique, and Chad will tell us about it, is uh, this was a little bit of a, a difficult guy and he was uh, a do-it-yourselfer as well, and so that makes it a, a little more difficult. And a couple of the things, Chad, you'll notice as he goes through this, is uh, Chad does, uh, there's a, a few things that Chad does that he does very, very, very well, and he was able to uh, turn this person uh, into a client. But, Chad, why don't you tell me um, from the, the, the very beginning on your first meeting with him um, um, why this guy was unique and, and, and just a little bit about that first meeting of uh, – uh, what was kind of difficult about it? Sure. Um, so this was my very first uh, meeting using the 5G system with um, anyone outside of friends and family. So my first, I guess, cold meeting. And it was through the eye-to-eye -eye marketing that I met this fella. 
And um, so I was a little bit nervous to begin with, but um, he kind of came out firing, uh, asking a lot of really uh, direct, pointed questions, and um, a meeting that, uh, as I understand it, the agreement meeting that should last 30 to 40 minutes, ended up going about two hours. And so, Chad, um, real quick, not to interrupt you. Um, yeah. So, was this guy? Did he? Was he a kind of guy that? Um, you know, we have kind of a way we want the meeting to go. Did he just follow smoothly and, and allow you just to, to be comfortable and, and did he just follow along with the process or did he kind of try himself um, to kind of take control of that meeting a little bit? Um, the latter. He absolutely tried, tried to take control of it. Um, I, I felt like I was looking over my shoulder at, at every turn. Um, not not one to follow the script at all uh, uh, as it goes to that. So how were you able to? How were you able to? Uh, and I'll, I'll I'll let you keep going through and not interrupt. But what was one of the skills that you always kept on the top of your mind to make sure that you were always making sure you're doing throughout that meeting, even though he wasn't following following it the way you wanted him to? Because I can imagine when someone is doing that, you can get rattled pretty quickly. Yeah, um, you can, and I definitely was. I just kept going back to Mike and Jeff's calls on Fridays of uh, getting on people's side that whenever things started to go sideways or they go off script saying anything that we didn't anticipate just to get on their side and that um, that could help smooth over the rough spots and just to kind of fast forward I left that two hour meeting thinking that it was done he said that he was going to get some of the statements to me, but I just assumed that he would. Um, and I called Missy and Mike immediately to try to, you know, because this was my first meeting and I wanted to figure out what went wrong and how to get better from it. And they were able to uh, help me and give me tips uh, along the way. Um, but to my surprise, the next day after I had finished another agreement meeting, um, this fellow came in with all of his statements. And uh, as I started to apologize for the meeting being either uncomfortable or me not uh, answering his questions in a way that he uh, would would like, um, he actually said that uh, he was just kind of testing me and kind of putting me through the gauntlet of questions that he asked advisors because I guess he gets seminar requests or workshop requests pretty frequently. Uh, with his level of assets, and um, uh, he was just kind of testing me. He said, "That's awesome." So here, here's this little backstory, too, guys. This is a, a, a do-it-yourselfer that's got around 1.2, 1.4 million, and he gave Chad a hard time throughout this whole entire meeting. And at the end of it, just like he said, I mean, Chad, you know, did the right thing. He was getting on his side constantly, um, and uh, he thought that the meeting was blown and the guy had told him that he was just testing him. And so that's one of the things I just think is such a big deal because easily Chad could have had preconceived notions that, hey, this guy's a do-it-yourselfer. I mean, he was trying to tell Chad what to do. He was trying to control the meeting. And I think this is just a huge lesson for people all the time is clients and prospects out there, they're testing us. I mean, you think about it in this business. You know, you get someone off of marketing and they have 200, 300, 500, a million dollars. Um, if they're the kind of clients we want, especially if they still have that money or if they're not working with someone, these are people that, um, I mean, they, in, 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 you know, we'll have from time to time people say, hey, the people said they didn't have any money. They do want to go through this process with us. Take them through that process. People, people will test. I mean, they'd be fools if they didn't because if they would just turn over a couple hundred thousand dollars after a meeting or two, or, I mean, we should expect them to be cautious. So people will be testing you, and, and don't be surprised if people say, well, I don't have any money. Because the reason why they have money is because if, if they were to be just as easily just tell everybody everything they have right after a meeting, or maybe even two meetings, um, they, they would have been fleeced or fooled by someone in the past, most likely. So that's just a, an important thing. And, and Chad, you just trusted in 
you know, the process and, and getting on his side and, and turns out he tells it, hey, he was he was putting you to the test there. So I'll, I'll kind of just fast forward ahead in this meeting. So just eat now after that. So he, uh, he, he gets you the statements, Chad. Did the did the uh, the rest of the meeting or the the whole process go completely simple? I mean, did it all go scripted? I mean, just to kind of throw it in here. So you had went through the 21 point checklist with him, and then right. he went on a vacation for what, like about a month? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He 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 went out of the country for about a month. So you know, a guy goes out on vacation for a month. You may also be sitting here thinking, uh, am I ever going to get uh, this guy back in the you know, back in the office. I mean, those are, are kind of some right. things that will be coming in into mind. Now, um, real quickly on his assets there, so he had, I know he was a, uh, he had a huge pension, and he had, uh, um, you know, around 800 to a million dollars in some liquid assets. Now, when, when he showed you his assets, which ones did he say that you, you got to have a shot at working with? Uh, he, he said about... Uh, Eighty to a hundred thousand dollars in uh, in one of his IRAs. Well, I remember one of the things that you had brought to me because we were starting to to look at this right away, and I remember he had said, uh, and it, at first he had said you had a an annuity, he had an annuity that was two years old, and yeah. it was about two hundred thousand dollars. And which a two year annuity, as you guys know from working with me, there's nothing we can really do with that. And then he had a life insurance policy, and initially he had said that, and we put together a plan, but uh, um, you know he, he didn't really give you a whole lot. But what did he say about the other assets? Did he say you could or couldn't have a shot at those? Uh, yeah, I mean he 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 wanted me to look at the existing annuity and the life insurance policy first, and then he said, you know, I, I might be able to to look at uh, eighty to a hundred thousand dollars. And after we had in the implementation meeting reviewed the the 21, he kind of uh, once again went off script and and started to kind of negotiate my fee for it, uh, and uh, I just kind of let him go through that. I didn't really see it coming, but just got on the side. I said, okay, well, yeah. What? So, what were you kind of thinking there? And uh, then just after talking with you and and Jeff and Missy and Mike. Just knowing that you know, after I could get on his side, then I could easily pivot into the uh, the FIA presentation and what I do with all my clients. And, uh, well, real quickly here. So when that guy came in, so once you got to the implementation meeting, and yeah. he basically, you know, we all talk about how we want that meeting to go, but it right. doesn't always go that way. So how, how did when when he basically strolls in the meeting and says, you know. Here's here's what you you can all uh, so he liked you. You did a great job. You got on his side. You went through the process, and you're able to build some trust up. But then, um, once he comes to you and he says, "All right, you can have a hundred thousand dollars, and you're going to pay uh, uh, I'll pay you seventy basis points." Did that rattle you a little bit, or or did or how did you feel after he started trying to tell you how to how how things were going to go? Sure. That would yeah, and and it, and it did because uh, he he was saying, you know, I, I I could just go ahead and manage this money, and we could put it into an index fund or or this or that, and um, I I was just thinking, well, uh, okay, um, I uh, rather try to resist. Or say how we could do things differently at that moment. Hey, Chad, we're losing you there, dude. I just heard out. Chad? Chad, can you hear me? Wanted to get his thoughts on. Chad, can you hear me? Chad. Hey, Missy, can you hear me? I can Why hear you. Yeah. Chad. Uh, just Chad, really Chad, wanted Chad, to get Chad. on the side. And, Chad. Uh, just because it was something. Well, it was that score, you know? Chad, can you hear me? So oh, like what do you think? Okay, yeah. so I think his internet dropped out. So, um, so Jerry, just summarize then, would you? Yeah, 
Yeah, I can summarize what happened. You know, this is the thing that I was I was so excited about for Chad is because him and I had conversations where I said, hey, I know he says, you know, you have this $2 million annuity and you, and you have this life case. But I said, hey, go through the FIA presentation. You know, clients don't know what's, what's available to them until they know what's available to them. So I know, you know, don't be worried about them being mad. Go to trust the system. Go through the FIA presentation. If you go through the FIA, he's going to discover that's what he wants, and that's what he's going to he's going to tell he wants it. So even though Chad, the guy, tried to take control of that implementation meeting, Chad got on his side, and then he still went through it. And he could have took the easy way out and said, oh, "I'll take your hundred grand for seventy basis points," but he went through that FIA presentation with him, and by the end of it, the the uh, the client says, "Hey, well, let's put two hundred thousand dollars and put it in that." So Chad put in that extra work and it paid off with them. And as we all know, do-it-yourselfers, they can, they can be pretty difficult. We're just trying to get a piece of that. And, you know, this is a guy who's a do-it-yourselfer, not, not just be, you know, obviously he, he distrusts other people. So by Chad getting on his side, he's not, a, he's not a pro at this process at all. But I've heard Mike say plenty of times, you know, if you can get on people's side, people do business with people they like. So that's something he's done great. So, you know, kind of just the, the moral I wanted to bring this on is, you know, don't prejudge the people that you bring on. You know, uh, take the people through the process. People are going to um, test you. They're going to make things tough. They may not always tell you what they have right away because they're trying to, um, I, I think it's interesting, if you guys can think back to when he had your original training when he came out here, Mike shows he says A to B, and he goes, us as advisors, we can look at it, and we say, hey, we know how to fix their problem, and we want to go as quickly as we can from A to B. But then Mike will show you guys that, but the client, they'll sit here, and Mike kind of draws a swirly line all over the place. You know, that, that's what clients are doing sometimes, and they may not even tell you what they, what they have until they've done one or two swirlies on it, because they're trying to figure out, can I trust you? And those are great clients, because we know that they can't, if, if they want that kind of client, they'd already have 10 annuities in their portfolio. So we just have to understand that going into meetings, and Chad did a, a fantastic job of, of uh, not prejudging this person, getting on their side, and it kind of reminds me of someone who plays like a football team that plays great defense. They're never out of the game if you get, if you get on someone's side. So he, just, he did a fantastic job. Well, and he didn't whip out. He followed the process. What would most guys, hey, Jeff, uh, Jeff, what would most guys would do, especially um, early on with the process? What would most guys do when the a do it yourself or said, I'll give you 100 grand and pay you seven, uh, 70 basis points on that? Yeah, most guys will just go ahead and say, yeah, that's fine. I'll take that. Um, and then they'll, like Jerry talked about, take the easy money and take the easy way out and, and just... Uh, you know, take that money. I think the point is you really, there's no reason not to take everybody through the process. Um, it could have turned out that all he got was the 100,000 for 70 basis points, but he was going to get that anyway. And taking somebody through the process just gives you an opportunity to do even better. And you get some experience. And you you feel more confident going into the next meeting. I can't think of a reason not to take everybody through the entire process. Perfect. Thanks, Jerry. Chad, if you can hear me, thank you very, very much. And good job just following the process. And sometimes, guys, you just got to blindly follow the process. In fact, when I was at IDS, it was hilarious. When, <laughs> um, and I, in fact, I've been with three different organizations where they had stats. And who? let's see some answers to this. Who do you think does best, the people in the first six months or the people in the last six months? Do you think people do better in the first six months or the last six months of the first year? First six months or last six months? Tom and Jay say first. First, Perry, yep, so why? You guys are right, why in the first six months? Tom, Jay, and Perry. Nope, not family and friends. Why? They were scared and followed every part of the script <laughs> exactly right. And then after that, they got so smart, what'd they do? Started winging it, and guess what happened to their success? And, that, and the reason I bring that up is, guys, we've got 50,000 recorded meetings of this process. We'd probably have 60,000 or more if we kept 
uh, storing them. So we know the process works. Why would you do anything but the process? So follow the process. And then I had several questions of different questions. Uh, Bonnie, Fred, uh, Sam, all, all you guys, your answer to this, they were asking all various things of what if they do this at the first meeting or what if they don't show up to the next meeting? The answer to all of your questions is this. If they leave that meeting explaining to you why they want to go through the process and need to bring all their statements back, guess what they'll do? So let's get everybody to answer that. If they leave the first meeting explaining to you why they want to come back and need to bring all the statements to you, what will they do? Right, Mark, they're going to come back. Now, if you do all the explaining about whatever their concern was and why they need to go through the process anyways and come back, now what are they going to do? If you do all the explaining about whatever their concern was and why they need to come back, yeah, that's right. If you tell them why they need to come back, if you tell them why their particular objection was an objection, then guess what? They're not going to come back. So Bonnie, Sam, and Fred, does that make sense? Can I get you guys to answer me yes or no? And if it doesn't make sense, call them. Guys, what have I told you over and over and over? If you run into a problem, what do you need to do? You have the most powerful tool in this industry. You have the most powerful tool in this industry. More, you have a tool that no other FMO, no other advisor has. That's right, Jonathan. Call Jeff. Call me. Ain't nobody can do what Jeff and I. I dare you to show me somebody else in this industry that can, they can that you can send a tape and they'll explain to you what went wrong and how to fix it. There's a lot of guys that are really good in this industry. There's a lot of guys that make a lot of money. Guess what? They cannot do. That's right. They can't teach Perry. So you have people here. You have one of us who's freaking, guys, <laughs> I'll humbly say I'd kick ass on anybody in this industry. You put me against anybody in this effing industry, and I'd kick ass on them one-on-one. -on -one. Let's go. Plus, I can teach, and Jeff teaches better than me. So you have two tools that nobody else in this industry has, two guys that can teach and one guy who's probably, I'll humbly say, better than any other freaking salesperson in this industry okay so make sure if you've got a question don't sit there and wonder what to do why would you want to do that get a hold of Jeff get a hold of myself we'll tell you exactly how to fix it make sense good so here we go don't uh, people don't buy from desperate advisors and here's a great thing about Chad he wasn't desperate anytime he felt uh, constrained felt uh, felt um, like the guy was taking control, all he did was get on the guy's side. Call me, get on the side. But I want to walk through. This is from a, a book that I've just read talking about how people look desperate. And people buy or don't buy from desperate people. They don't buy. So you assumed, uh, here's the first thing, never assume. So never assume that they want to go forward. Never assume that they get you. Never assume that they're excited about your product. Because what do desperate people do? I mean, you want to come with me today, don't you? You want to come with me? That's assumption. When you start assuming what they want to do, guess what? That's a sign of desperation. Now, that's kind of counterintuitive. What they're talking about here with assumed, I go in assuming they're going to move all their money to me. But I never assume that they're going to do any particular step. I never assume they're going to do any. I assume they're going to move all the money to me, but I never assume they're going to do any particular step. How do I know that they're going to do any particular step in the process? How do I know? They tell me exactly, Jay. Next thing is relationships are like. <laughs> this is Kevin Hart. Relationships are like farting. If you push too hard, things can get messy really fast. And what it, what that means is. Don't push the process forward. Let them push the process forward. Let them invite you in. Um, the, the, one of the examples is, is if, if they quit returning your calls or they, re, they answer your calls but keep delaying meetings, don't push and push and push for that meeting. Just simply say, you know, after the third re, re, um, um, reschedule, I'm going to say, 
when they're returning the calls, they're talking to you, but they keep rescheduling. I say, hey, if you really want, it sounds like your life is really kind of busy right now, and that's cool. We'll keep we'll keep rescheduling this till we can get together if this is something you really want to do. But if you're just delaying meeting with me because you're too nice to say that you don't want to meet with me, just let me know. I got tons of people that want to meet with. I got tons of people who want my help. So if you're doing this because you just want to be nice and don't want to say no, just tell me no. If it's really that you're busy and really that you want to do this but there are things happening, hey, I'm, I'm as patient as they can be. I just don't want you to feel like I'm constantly bothering you. So when I do that, guess what? They, nine times out of ten, guess what they're going to tell me? That they want to move forward or they don't want to move forward? They tell me that they do want to move forward. But if I kept pushing, 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 pretty soon, guess what they would do? They would start to not want to take my phone calls and things like that. So never push. Make them advice. What do we say at the end of the third meeting? We talked about this on Friday. At the end of the third meeting and then at the beginning of the, I'm sorry, at the end of the uh, second meeting, at the beginning of the third meeting, we always say what? Where do you see me fitting in? I don't say, hey, would you like my help? Would you like me to help you? No, that's pushing. Instead, I say, where do you see me fitting in? They have to invite you in. When you push yourself in, that is, that is desperate. We jump too quick to pinpoint a certain problem. Again, this is an this was an example today of Chad when the guy said, "Okay, I'll give you a hundred grand, give you a hundred grand, 70, uh, 70 basis points." If you jumped in, guess what? What'd that tell you? What would that? And I want everybody to answer this. If he said sure, what would that tell that guy? That's right. That he was desperate. He'll take anything. Follow the process. Don't jump too quick. Well, Mike, you know, they really push back about all the statements. They didn't want to give me the statements and they just want to talk about some money, so I just went ahead and showed them the money. Now they don't want to meet with me anymore. After I've given that information, now I don't want to meet with them anymore. How do I get them back into my office? Guess what I tell those people, advisors, that tell me that. You don't. Just next time, guess what? What do you do next time? Follow the process. Okay, we have how many skips? We have three different scripts to get them to give us all of their statements. So guess what you got to get really good at next time? Those scripts. Bending the rules, that's just the same example. Okay, I'll go ahead and take you through the process because you are uncomfortable giving me these statements. Who just took control of that meeting process? They did. Guess what the chances of you getting any business? When they've taken over the selling process, guess what the chance of you getting any of the business is? That's right, Jay Zippo. That's right, Bruce Zippo. On the other hand, drawing a line in the sand, telling them this is the way it is, and if you don't want to deal with it, blah, 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 blah. That's not any good either. We have a process. If, if they're pushing back, what do we do, guys? Yeah, we got Spruce. We get on their side. So th th we never draw a line in the sand. Whenever they tell us whatever the, their line in the sand is, we agree with them. We agree with them wholeheartedly. We agree with them not 100%. We agree with them 150%. And then we have a reasonable conversation where the, the reasonable conversation is the waves washing right over that uh, line, their line in the sand and making it disappear. But that will not happen until you get on their side. And dudes, when you do get out of control, when the meeting does go in a direction you don't know, uh, they, uh, they do start to push back. If, if you feel any time that the meeting is getting out of control, what do you do? At any time, if you feel the meeting is getting out of control, what do you do? No, you don't gots. What do you do? Because remember, it has to... The meeting getting out of control has to do with who? The client or you? We got one right answer. When the meeting is getting out of control, ah, Jerry's got it, Cheryl's got it, it's about you, right, Jonathan? It's about you. So God's isn't going to help you. What's going to help you? I'm getting all sorts of techniques, but and all the techniques would work for depending on what. Hey guys, is there any one thing that can cause a meeting to get out of control? 
you have a talker and they want to go blah 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 blah, or you have somebody who's who uh, I mean th th is argumentative with you. You have somebody who's there's all sorts of different techniques we have to handle those things. But the first thing you have to do is handle yourself. So how do you handle yourself? And Jerry's the only one that's got it so far. Ah, Tom. Jerry and Tom got it. Pause. Relax. Take a breath. Because what happens is when you panic, what happens to the speed of your voice? Speeds up. What happens to your breath? Speeds up. What happens to your ability to think? Slows down. Guys, if you feel the meeting's getting out of process, whether they're getting argumentative, or whether you said something that was embarrassing, or whether you lost your place, or what, I, there's a gazillion reasons why you might think the meeting's getting out of control. When you think the meeting's out of control, stop. Relax, take a breath, and then decide which way you're going to go. Speeding up is how you naturally are going to uh, um, address it, and that's going to be nothing but bad things. Make sense? Slow it down. Because, you know, nervous people speak fast or slow. Desperate people speak fast or slow. They speak fast. Slow it down. Make sense? And the other thing is that you quit listening. You quit listening. So when I hear guys panic and they get desperate because they think the meeting's out of control, all of a sudden they start to speed up, they stop asking questions, or when they ask questions, they answer their own questions, they're not even listening to what the client has to say, because they, they, it's almost like they want to get out of this dangerous situation as fast as possible. So the faster I talk, the less I let them interrupt me, the quicker I'm going to, no. Slow it down, listen to what they have to say, okay? So that's how to not look desperate. Here's how to actually, so that's what you don't want to do. Here is what you want to do. Okay, this is what you do want to do. So if you want to have a good life, and this has nothing to do, or it has everything to do with your business, but also what to do with just life in general. Do these things instead. Stop going through the motions. What do I mean, stop going through the motions? Guys, if you show up at work, read the paper, do your email, see whoever you're going to see, and then go home. That's what? That's going through the motions. If on the weekends you get up, drink your coffee, read your paper, do it, that's going through the motions. For a good life, guess what you got to do? You got to be involved with your life. You can't just simply go through the motions. What you do today is important because you're ex ex are exchanging a day of your life for it. So think about what did you do yesterday? Would that really have been what you would have done in your last day? And it's, you know, we can't really live our lives that today is the last day of our life. But we should darn well try to. We should darn well try to. Don't. The one resource we can't get more of is what? That's the only reason. We can get more money. We can get more everything. The only thing we can't get more of is yeah, everybody's saying time. That's right. We can't get more time. So what are you doing with your time? Watching TV? If that's what you're doing, guess what? You're wasting it. But let's talk about this, how to be, have a good life with our business. First is seek to understand, then to be understood. Listen to other people's ideas and feelings. I look other people in the eyes when I'm talking. We've done experiments with this with our guys. Guess, do you think you're looking too much in people's eyes or not enough in people's eyes? I guarantee you, not enough. I try to see things from other people's point of view. I listen to others without interrupting. What does this sound like, guys? Seek first to understand, then to be understood. It's exactly everything we're asking you to do with 5Q. And you gotta love other people. If you don't love the, guys, why do I get pissed when I hear you guys say tire kickers and plate lickers? Is that an endearing or is that a, is, is that a, um, a dismissive? Label. It's negative, right, Tom? You know what? Why? Sh if if they are, hey, everybody's a tire kicker and a plate licker. So you either better love everybody or hate everybody, because everybody's a tire kicker and a plate licker. Because ain't anybody gonna just anybody who is is, is gonna just let any salesperson believe any salesperson they run into. 
where are they going to be right now? If people just believed every single salesperson they ran into, where would they be right now? Broke, right, Andre. Broke, right, Perry. So quit labeling people. Oh, these people have no money. And I've, t I've told, I can't imagine how many times I've told guys this, and when they get this through their frigging skulls, it's amazing how all the people they're in front of that didn't have money, all of a sudden, after they get this through their head, everybody has money again. Guys, guess what? Guess how many times I've told people in the last year I have no money? Often, Perry. Perry, why have I told people I don't have money? Because anybody who wants to know if I have money, what do they want me to do with my money? So, guess when they find out I have money? When did they find out I have money? Yeah, it's when they have what I want. When I find out they have what I want, all of a sudden I got all the money in the world. So don't be, just because somebody says they don't have any money, and Jerry always talks about his aunt who runs around in an oversized sweatshirt that has a, a wolf howling on it, lives in a trailer, has um, less than uh, <laughs> uh, uh, pristine English, and she's wealthier than I am by many by multitudes. Just because somebody says they don't have money, just because they look like they don't have money, it means nothing. And if I love people, guess what? If I love people, guess what? Yeah, that's right, Bruce. I want to help them anyways. It should be regard. It shouldn't matter whether they have money or not. If they're in my office and I love them, I'm going to help them. And it's amazing how many times people with no money, once you help them, all of a sudden start to find money. So you got to love people, dudes. Oops. And have patience. Got to have patience with them. You got to have patience with the process. You got to have patience with yourselves. You got to have patience with learning the system. Because does anything good happen overnight? Does anything good happen overnight? Nothing. Nothing good happens overnight. Good things happen over time. And it's the people who are willing to put in that time and have the patience that are able to reap those rewards. The sad, but here's the sad thing about life. Good things take, take forever to happen. Bad things happen how, how quickly? How quickly do bad things happen? In the moment, right, Perry, in the moment. So this is an interesting one, because when I was reading the book, this really made a point that, that I hadn't thought about before. Do you know who your customers are? And then I started to think about, back about many of the books I've written about the, most, the, about the most successful companies, the most successful entrepreneurs out there. Guess who they viewed as their customers? Who do you think the most successful entrepreneurs or companies, uh, that have grown, that companies that have been created in the last 10 years, guess who they all looked at as their customer? Got everyone? Nope. And themselves? Nope. Ah, Jay got it. Their employees. They looked at their employees as being their customers. If they educated, if they were patient with their employees, if they educated their employees, if they gave their employees uh, and treated employees uh, wonderfully, guess what magically happened? What magically happened when they treated their employees that way? Their employees treated their customers that way. The business thrived. Exactly, Perry. The business thrived. People with passion can change the world for the better. That's the other thing. You've got to have passion in today's world. You've got to have passion for what you do. And I've told guys this. Uh, I've told some, uh, a few guys that I've talked to about the DOL in April. I said, dudes, you're at the cusp of, of, of a huge growth in our industry. But if you're tired of the industry, guess what? If you're tired of, if you think everybody you're meeting is tire kickers and plate lickers, if you're tired of the paperwork, if you're tired of the industry, then you need to what? If you're tired, you need to what? Get out. Get out. Get out of the business. Find something that you like. Because you're never going to be any good at something that you don't like. 
okay? You got to have passion for what you do. You got to love what you do. You got to love the people you're working with. And they gotta, you got to show that you love them. And you got to constantly be learning, improving, and mastering. What's the, what's the one tool? This is actually a, a physical tool that you have that you can hold in your hand. What's the one tool that can make sure you're doing that? What's the one tool? I want everybody to answer this. I got one answer right, another one right. Okay, Jonathan, Jerry, Kyle, you got it? Bert's got it? Come on, guys, what is it? It's the recorder. Because you know what? Doing the 15 minute drill without a recorder? Worthless. Doing a 21 without a recorder? Worthless. Doing the scripts without a recorder? Worthless. Why? Why are those things, why doing those things are they, are they worthless without a recorder? The only way you can improve if you know what to improve on. If you're doing it the wrong way, that ain't helping you, it's hurting you. Because it's just making it going to be that, make it that much more difficult to fix that later on. Remember when I did the call on deliberate practice. Deliberate practice, feedback is essential, right. When I did the, the uh, deliberate practice, what? The, uh, listening to me. Putting me on tape and listening to me on the treadmill and listening to me until, uh, when you're walking, what is that worth, guys? What's that worth? If you're constantly listening to me on, on a treadmill or when you're walking, what's that worth? Got a couple right answers. That's right, nothing. How you learn, improve, and master is you shut the door, turn off your phones, both of them, your business phone and your cell phone. Uh, turn turn off your email, lock the door, and what? Learn, tape yourself, listen to yourself, improve on what you did, learn, tape yourself, improve what you just did, learn, tape yourself, listen to yourself, improve what you just did until you've mastered whatever skill you're working on. That's what you need to be doing. And keep it simple. When you're learning something, how many things should you be learning at one time? One script at a time. And when you're learning one script at a time, how much of that script should you be learning at one time? Just one crib note. Make it simple. When you do it simple, it's amazing what you can do when you do one simple thing after another. Because by the end of the day, you've accomplished a lot of things. Trying to do a whole bunch of stuff, not good. One thing at a time, done over and over and over, you can accomplish an awful lot. The word listen contains the same letters as the word silent. Listen by staying silent. And guys, is it really that hard to ask questions? Is it hard to ask questions? Is it hard to ask open-ended questions? If your life depended on it, I guess what you'd all magically be able to do. So it has nothing to do with how hard it is. Asking questions is simple. Because if I sat in your office and said, listen, if you're not asking open-ended questions, I'm going to shoot you in the kneecap every time you, something comes out of your mouth that's not an open-ended question. Guess what? You'd all magically be able to then what? Ask open-ended questions. And here's the funny thing. Not 10 years, not 10 months, not 10 weeks, not 10 days, not even 10 hours, but just 10 minutes after tr making that commitment, guess what would happen to your questions? They'd be getting better. Guess what would be happening to your awkward silences as you're trying to figure out what's my, how can I make the next thing I want to say turn that into a question? Those little gaps are going to get shorter. Make it a priority, and it's a simple thing to do. Work smarter, not harder. Guys, it costs you the same. The guys that are doing these eye to eyes, guess what? It costs them the same <laughs> whether they close one person or six people. One person or six people cost them the same. Guess what? The work was the same too. And in fact, I would argue that it, it, it was less work to close six people than one people. Because when did they do their work? When did the people who closed six people, the people that closed over two million from one eye to eye, when did they do their work? During the, well, during the eye to eye, when did they do their work? When did the people who closed two million dollars with the eye to eye do their work. They did it last July and August. That's when they did their work. Not yeah, be, not before the meeting, unless you're saying way before the meeting. 
Not beforehand, unless you're saying way beforehand. They mastered the system in July and August. Guess what they were magically had then during September and October? They made more money than they ever knew they could in, a, in, a, in two months. They made more than they did in the last year. Why? Because they put in the work up front. Once you learn how to speak, but if you're trying to learn how to speak Spanish by learning a few words every day, guess what? That's tough. You put in the work beforehand, all of a sudden it's easy. I tell my son who's getting into college that being a salesman is either the highest paying, easiest job in the world, or the lowest paying, most difficult job in the world. And whether it's either one of those is up to who? It's up to you. And we've given you the tools. It's amazing now that the guys that, we've had guys that have been, been on for three years and struggled, 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 for some reason, whatever tripped their trigger this summer, getting ready for that eye, they finally mastered the 21-point the, uh, checklist. Jeez, I, I have one guy that made more, more money the last, uh, in the last two months than he made combined over the last two years. Why? Because he for whatever reason, he hit bottom of the barrel and he mastered the 21. Guys, work smarter, not harder. Put in the work, and then once you put in the work and learn the 21, guess what? Everything's easy. It's like the client knows the script. See, and Jeff, could you speak to that? The, the, the light bulb moment that guys have with the system. Yeah, I think the light bulb moment is um, we're so conditioned to try and tell people that what you're doing is wrong, that you look at the 21 point checklist as a way to get, a better way to get people to, a, I, I think you take two, you hear two things that we say. We, you hear us say well, you have to do the 21, and then you hear us say you have to get them to tell you, so you think, oh, this is perfect. Now I have, I've been trying to tell people that what they're doing is wrong, but now I have a way and a list to get them to tell me that what they're doing is wrong. And then you bump your head and you say, well, that doesn't really work. I mean, I'm doing a little bit better than I was, but I'm not doing a lot better. You don't do a lot better until the light bulb goes off and you realize, hey, this isn't about what they're doing. It's about who they're doing it with. Now I don't have to get people to say what they're doing is wrong, because, yeah, that's, that's pretty hard, especially when the Dow is at 18,000. But I can get them to say whether the Dow is 14,000, 18,000, or someday in the future, 25,000. I can get them to say in their own words, if I do the system right, if I use the 21 right, yeah, my guy is screwing me. And then, the, and, and then people, especially people with money, don't want to work with him anymore. And that's when the light bulb goes off, when you realize that's what this is about. I thought it was about what they're doing. I realize now it's about who they're doing it with, and when that light bulb goes off, it just explodes. And guys, we've given you the tool to do that. Well, you don't need to know how to do that. Why do you not need to know how to do that? Why do you not need to know how to do that? Because Jeff's absolutely right. That is the light bulb moment. Why do you not need to know how to do that? That's when you can close every single person. Why do you not need to know how to do that? Because I wrote a script for you 18 years ago that's been used tens of thousands of times, and it works. So if you follow the script, guess what the script always ends up doing the last 10% of the script? Having them tell you why their guy is disrespecting them. Having them tell you why their guy is disrespecting them. So you've got the tools, work smarter, not harder. You're going to have to work hard for a couple of months so that you can work easy for the rest of your life. Show gratitude for what you have. Every, I mean, that's the way you should start every day, and that's the way you should uh, turn off every day, is thanking whoever you worship for what, whatever you have and whatever they've given you. That's the way you should start your day, and that's the way you should end your day. If you do that, you're going to have a whole different attitude. And I always have a work-life balance. And I'll tell you straight out, most guys I find, guess where the balance is in this industry? Not in most industries, but in this industry, guess where I find most of your balance? Working too much or living too much? Living too much, exactly. 
You know, and here's the sad thing. If you worked more and worked smarter, guess what? Your life would be way better anyways. But find some sort of balance. Balance means about getting, uh, making, and uh, thinking about what you're doing. We're right back to where we began. Think about what you're doing. Live purposefully. At the end of the day, say, what did I accomplish? What, why is, is the world better? Why am I better? Why is my family better off than it was when I woke up this morning? If you don't have a good answer for that, guess what that day was? A big fat zero. Make sense? And it, it, it's, you got to make it a habit. So this is more big picture stuff, but guys, guess what? This big picture stuff is the difference between successful people and unsuccessful people. So go back and watch this tape again. Come up with a plan to put these things into action. Start living your life with purpose across the board. Okay? You do that, and your life is, you're going to have the good life. You're not going to, in fact, it's not going to have a good life. You're going to have a, a great life. And everybody around you is going to see what a different person you are. Okay? So you have a great rest of the week. Happy Halloween. And wear your reflective tape out tonight, and we'll talk to you all on, uh, we won't talk to you on Friday, but look for our, remember we said Friday calls are now going to be a five-minute tape review that we'll send to you on Thursday, so you can work on that on, on Friday. So hope you all have a great ha Halloween, and we'll talk to you next Monday. Thanks, everybody.